So thank you very much, Susie, for this nice introduction. Um, first of all, I want to mention it again. Uh, I'm very honored to be here, and thank you for the organization for inviting me to talk about uh, here on your nice congress. It's a big congress I always see. Uh, it's well organized, like I mentioned. So congratulations to your organizers. Um, first of all, I want to tell also something, a little bit thing about EONS, the European Oncology Nursing Society. Um, Danny already told us about the educational framework, and there are free copies on the back of the room, so you can collect them. But it's in English, and if you are a member of uh, EONS, we acknowledge that language has a barrier at some times, but therefore we have established like a translation grant. So if you are a member of EONS, you can go for this translation grant and translate even like documents in your own language, and that help us all forward, I think. So. There are all other opportunities of EONS. If you're going, to, we have like uh, already some grants available, uh, travel grants, like also scientific and research grants. We have a nice research proposal workshop and also a PhD uh, workshop. So if you're a member of EONS, you're all welcome to join us and apply for these nice things. And I think I have experienced some of this workshop, also the master class of oncology nursing. And it's really great to do this and to connect with people and taking all this knowledge back home and create something in your own country uh, in collaboration with all your healthcare providers together so that we can give the best care to our patients. So thank you. So today they invited me to speak about infusion-related reactions, and that's a big area, if you ask me to talk about. Uh, there are a lot of things related to this topic, so I hopefully picked some interesting things out of to talk about you, uh, to talk about infusion-related reactions. So I have nothing to disclosure. So the content I choose today to talk about was recognizing and management of hypersensitivity reactions, like the infusion-related ones, extravasation of anti-cancer drug, and the nursing management of nausea and vomiting. All a small overview, and I think the slides will be available after the Congress for the nurses, so you don't have to take any pictures. It will be available for you, and it's free to have. So no Colleagues, you can photograph all the slides, and then we'll be... Dear colleagues, all the slides will be available after the conference. Please don't photo. Take photos. So my objectives, uh, a lot of them, we can go over it, but I will start with a presentation. Because the most important thing is also this discussion. So if you have any questions, feel free to ask, and feel free to interrupt, because this is important for us. So the first thing is like recognizing and management of hypersensitivity reactions. So a first question to you all, how many of you have been confronted with an acute hypersensitivity reaction when administrating chemotherapy? Yes, two hands I see, three, yeah. Don't be, don't be afraid, it's nothing wrong or right, it's good to know. So some of you are confronted with this reaction. Um, and do you feel confident if that happens, what to do? Who feel confident to manage a hypersensitivity reaction with a patient as a nurse? No one. No one? <laughs> <laughs> so I can ask who doesn't feel comfortable to do it with a patient if Colleague, this happens? Colleagues, raise your hand. You don't feel that there is a reaction of hypersensitivity. Dear colleagues, please raise your hands. Who felt uncomfortable while witnessing a hypersensitivity reaction? Don't be afraid of uh, raising hands. And that's still happening also in Belgium, so don't be afraid to tell this. It's not uh, better somewhere else. But it's good to know what we can do as a nurse and how we can collaborate with the medics to have good care for our patient if this happens. So I will go to my presentation by case. Uh, we see in our hospital, uh, you all are familiar with like these nice old ladies that coming to the oncology ward. Uh, this lady had a hematological condition, and she was outpatient treated, so was not admitted at the ward, and she wanted to get rituximab. In this case, it was a condition that the doctor told her, we could start with this treatment, or you could still wait, and they make a shared decision, and they talked about, okay, I will start with the treatment, because it was once a month, so it was easily going for this patient, and she admitted to the outpatient clinic for the admission. But unfortunately, 
when we started rituximab with this patient, in a couple of minutes, she showed some reactions. She didn't feel any well. She had back pain, chest pain, and we had to immediately stop the infusion. So what happened? So if we see hypersensitivity reactions, uh, what is this? So it's an immune hematological emergency in cancer care because we need to react and react fastly if this happens with patients. So we have several ones we can classify it. Like we have a drug-induced hypersensitivity. It's not mostly directly. We see it after a couple of days, mostly. We have infusion-related reactions that we see immediately. We have also like reactions on transfusions of blood components or platelets that can happen. So that's also a very, uh, that's an emergency also. And we have also like disseminated intravascular coagulation, which is a, a difficult condition. Uh, but we have to concentrate in this talk, I'm going to talk about infusion-related reactions. So what is it, an infusion-related reaction? Mostly it's unforeseen. We don't expect it with our patient. We expect it to go with the treatment and that everything went OK. But we see a reaction at some times. It occurs in one hour, or it could be like in some minutes, even directly if we start with administrating, it could be a reaction, give a reaction. That's acute. It could be also like in hours after or days after the infusion, and that mostly sends about like a drug-induced hypersensitivity reaction. So, and what do we see if it's acute? We see a rash, we see oedema, dyspnea, rhinitis, chest pain with patients, also back pain we can experience, and we can also see anaphylactic reactions if it gets worse. So it's very important we, we act immediately if we see this. So, which types are they described? Uh, we see type one, an early onset of symptoms. It's itching, chest pain, rush, pain. Uh, and we see the mechanisms are also important to know, but it's very important to know the symptoms. Um, we see a type two, it's hemolysis, thrombocytopenia. It's getting worse, chronic joint pain. And we have also like delayed reactions, and we see all the mechanisms. It's important as background, I think. But a clinical presentation of an acute uh, hypersensitivity reaction, the symptoms occur immediately, occurring during a few minutes of infusion. So mostly it's going that patients are administered. You get an cannulation and you start your therapy. And there see we have some actions we can do to prevent these acute reactions. So we have types of symptoms with these patients. Uh, we have mild symptoms, and that's good because we can talk about the patients about it, and the patients mostly can say it, is this happening? When they are like flushing, itching, uh, getting edema in the face and the hands, we see this as a nurse, we can observe uh, this. Uh, people, people can talk about abdominal cramps. If they get abdominal cramps, we have to be aware, oh, something can be happening, of us already happening with our patient. And also back pain is also a symptom we see a lot with the uh, reactions. Severe symptoms, chest pain, bronchospasm, tachycardia, or very serious actions, and it could be like an anaphylaxis to the drug, so it's very important we act very quickly with these patients. So if we see on the drugs, uh, I don't know, most people work with platinum salts related. We see cisplatin, 5 to 20% within minutes you can have a reaction. Carboplatin, 1 to 44% early infusion. And it's building up. If you go more than six cycles, it can be more common to have an, an infusion reaction about it. Oxoplatin, also the same case. Taxane associated products. Uh, we see up to 30%, but less than 4% if we use pre-medication. And we could, uh, we could yesterday witness like they implemented and they translated schemes from ESMO and ASCO, and we, I saw uh, the pre-medication was already on it, so that's a great deal to do. So in that way, we can also prevent these acute reactions with our patients. So we have also like monoclonal antibodies. Think about our patient, patient case in this way. Uh, 2 to 10% in the first infusion, transtuzumab, cetuzumab, and the other are less common, but they're also seen. So we, don't, we have to be aware it can always happen if we're administrating these drugs with our patient. So the severity 
Um, we have like uh, the common toxicity grades, severity of one, mild transition reactions, uh, infusion interruption is mostly not indicated, and an intervention is not indicated. You can just slow down the infusion a little bit, uh, and then we see patient can, as can go on with the infusion. Uh, but mostly, what I see in common practice as like a type two, and we have to interrupt therapy. We have to stop immediately the infusion, and we see that patients, if they get medication, the, the, the problems resolve in, in 24 hours, and we can go on with therapy. Yeah. Then we have build up again and start again with therapy on a slower dose or slower rate to give it to the patient. Of course, we don't want any grade five of our patients because then we lose our patients and that's not good practice, I think. So another question, sorry I trigger you so much. Um, how many of you have pre-treated teaching tools on hypersensitivity reaction? So who is teaching patients about hypersensitivity reactions in the clinic? Are you doing this? Unfortunately, our nurses, they not, as far as I know, yeah. Our nurses don't teach patients. Please comment. Uh, a nurse, if she's experienced, uh, if she knows about reactions, when she talks uh, with a patient, she can inform the patient, but it's not her job responsibility. Uh, a nurse is not authorized to talk to the patient. It's uh, the responsibility of a doctor. Why, unfortunately, our sister as nurses they not perform any kind of lectures uh, to teach patient about hypersensitivity reaction. If nurse, if nurse is well, you know, experienced, etc., uh, he, he or she can perform uh, uh, treatment for hypersensitivity. But in most cases, they ask to do doctors. But our nurses do not provide teach uh, education for patients. But Irina is working on it. Yeah. Uh, and uh, I'm sorry. S sorry, uh, someone wants to comment. Uh, Tell us in Russian, I will translate. I'd like to make a comment. In our algorithms, they say that before uh, make any procedure to a patient, we have to inform the patient about uh, the procedure, about the manipulation how the intramuscular intravenous injection will happen. If we are talking about chemotherapy, about the medications, a nurse may or can talk with the patient about this, but it's responsibility of a doctor. Uh, our uh, our nurses normally can speak with patient about that, yeah, about potential hypersensitivity, etc. But in most cases, they do not do it, and it's uh, a doctor's prerogative, let's say. Yeah, and we, we have comment. more discussion. How it happens in practice? I am Larissa. I work in the ambulatory chemotherapy surgery. When a doctor prescribes this or that medication, he informs fully a patient about what may happen. When a patient comes to our surgery, to our room, once again, we inform a patient about uh, possible consequences of chemotherapy. In practice, it works as I mentioned. We repeat uh, the words of the doctor once again. Oh, we do this before the infusion. Thank you so much, Larissa. Thank you for this nice comment. But I think like this is like informing patients and teaching patients. It's like a common goal we have. It's like working together. It's not one. It's not a, just a, the task of the doctor. It's not just the talk of the nurse. It's just important we collaborating and we support and empower our patients that they know about side effects or even about infusion-related side effects. So how we can prevent this? Um, 
We now we have we can implement individual pre-treatment teaching, pre-medication, and I was always witnessing this last day that was already in the protocols, and that's very well. But it's also very important we all know about this and we all talk about this. So we can educate about this possibility that patients could have like an infusion-related reaction, because we need to educate our patients to recognize the symptoms and that they know when to have to talk to the nurse or to the doctor when something's happened. Because sometimes patients aren't aware, or aren't aware about the severity of one of the reactions. For example, if a patient's got abdominal cramps, some patients think maybe I eat something wrong, but it's just starting off an infusion-related reaction, so it's important they notice this to the nurse or to the doctor. So we have also to empower patients, and when this happens, they could ex yeah, feel like anxiety and be anxious about what's happened. So we need to empower them that it's normal, it can be happen, and what they have to do so that be, they feel stronger to the self-management of themselves and they can act correctly. So this is an example how you can teach patients, how you can implement like these tools and give information leaflets to the patients so they know if they get administrating therapy again, that they know what could happen and that they know what therapy they're getting. So how we can prevent it? So routine medication, we see antihistaminic and antipirates, uh, titrating infusion, so with rituximab we, all, we build up very slowly, that's very important, that we build up slowly, that patients can get used to the therapy, and even we can stop it correctly. But we also see, like in studies, that IV line pre-medication, pre, so uh, primed with rituximab can help, because if you don't, yeah, prime your rituximab at front in your lines. The first, if you're going titrating up your patients, the first doses the patients get are just saline solution. And when you get a higher speed, they directly get rituximab. So it could be important to, titrate, to prime your lines with the rituximab in the pharmacy or as you make it yourself in the laminar airflow closet. So, how are we going to manage it at uh, this uh, infusion-related reaction? I think it's obviously we immediately stop the infusion. So, um, but it's important to maintain the saline solution so we have an open access to the patient if we have to administer it in something. And it's very important we directly call to the physician. So. So what we can do as nurses, and maybe it's good, we talked about in the, in the previous session about can, standards of care, you can develop a standard of care and say like frequent vital assessments, how many times, who will do it, what are you gonna say to your doctor? We keep the normal saline solution infusion, we are administrating by protocol pre-medication that can help, if it's necessary respiratory support by oxygen therapy, be aware that patients maybe have like chemotherapy that is not, we cannot use like oxygen at that moment, so it's important that patients also informed about this. And if we, see, if we mention cardiac pain, chest pain, it's important to get an electrocardiogram. This you can put in like a standard of care, and that is all something you can already start with in collaboration with the physician. So what you're gonna do is like symptoms are completely resolved, you can restart the infusion, maybe at a rate 50% lower than officially started with. Uh, if we have a life-threatening uh, reaction, mostly we, we draw the drugs and we don't use it anymore, or we take another drug uh, to use. It's not important that we just manage it, it's also very important we follow up our patients um, because re-administrating drugs, it could be like saying like every time we're going to administrate the drugs, we have to pre-medicate this patient if it's not common use. Um, maybe sometimes in the future we can start lower infusion rates uh, with our patients or building up very slowly. Uh, desensitization protocols you can use, they are described, but mostly they're very time consumed. It's diluting the product, but then you need more, much time and much volume to use with our patients, so we don't use it in our hospital. And we see with platinum uh, products, you can do skin tests. It's already mentioned in the literature to do skin testing. Uh, but all this, you can see if there are any reactions between platinum salts, but it's not common use in practice even with us in Belgium. 
So I don't know, are there any questions about this topic? Early questions you want to ask? Коллеги, вопросы, какие-то комментарии есть, пожалуйста. Dear colleagues, any questions, any comments? Don't hesitate to ask them. You get the slide, so everything you don't have to uh, keep up. Um, so I go on with the next topic is extravasation of anti-cancer drugs. So how many people of you have never seen an extravasation? Коллеги, и вновь не стесняемся. You never saw it? Everybody saw an extravasation? Есть те, кто не видели, как выглядит экстравазация. Кто не видел, как выглядит экстравазация? Лариса, я думаю, что вы видели, я так подозреваю. I'm sure, Larissa, that you've seen what extravasation looks like. My intention, so it's still happening. So it's very important, because this is very important for our patients to manage this and to prevent this at first. Uh, I'm coming back to my original patient, and this is a true case. So our patient already had an acute infusion reaction, and then we go on with her transfusion, and at one moment she was calling to the nurse, and the nurse went in and they saw there was oh, something wrong with the infusion. And this was rituximab, and this was the result one hour after the extravasation. What a, yeah. So could you imagine this was a patient that could choose between therapy or not, and this happened to her patient. Firstly, she got a reaction. Secondly, an extravasation. So you can imagine she was not happy coming back for therapy after this. So at this point, what we did was like, we started like keeping the cannulation. This was very important. You know, stop therapy, obviously. Keeping the cannulation, redraw as many as possible of the product. And very important is, if you don't have any pressure on it, if you redraw infusion, uh, product because if you do pressure you massage the product in like the surroundings and that's very important not to do we have a protocol in our hospital we have to warn like the physician the oncologist but also directly going to plastic surgery they immediately come and look what they can do at that moment so the protocol is also very important if this happens, what you're going to do immediately so what is an extravasation? It's really a cardiovascular complication. If you do talk about it, it's paravasation of extravasation, and it's accidentally that it happens of drugs that's going to the surroundings of our patients, and it's not where it was not intended to be. And depending on the product, it's as like a potentially very severe reactions for the patient or consequences, and thinking about outcomes, very bad outcomes for our patients. So, if you look at the numbers in the literature, uh, 1.0 up to 6.5% of adverse effects in treatment is this common, uh, extravasations. Incident data vary between yeah, 0 and 11%. Uh, good news we see in the literature, overall incident is declining because we are more aware of this problem and we can act uh, correctly if this happens. But we have to think about in our background, do we know the data at that moment? Do we collect the data in our hospital? Because I was working a couple of years ago in another hospital, and I went to the physician and we were talking about like implementing like extravasation guidelines, and he said, why should we implement extravasation guidelines? We never see an extravasation. And I asked, like, do we make registration about extravasation? No, we don't have any data. So how can we know there is no extravasation in our hospital? So I think the first thing was like we implemented is like the registration if something happened like this. Because extravasation is important in chemotherapy, but could in other products it's also important outside the oncology award. Once I was witnesses of like a TPN, you know TPN, fluent uh, uh, patient, and the hand was really like blistering about it. So it's also common, like in pediatrics, it's also very important to know. So if we look at the risk factors of extravasation, we have two big areas, individual associated, but also procedure associated. And we see it's most individual, we have our patient, but also staff related uh, risks. Uh, otherwise, we see like the workflow related and the substance related. Because I already told you like the severity of the, the wound or the outcome of extravasation as related to the product. 
So if we see what could be an outcome for our patient, uh, mostly the patients have pain, injury, surgery, have mostly loss of function at that moment, but also afterwards, if surgery has to apply of plastic surgery, they have like scarings, wound pain, uh, extra, uh, extra impact on care, uh, but also a financial impact because we need like wound care, wound dresses that cost lots of some patients. But also management of cancer, delays, loss of effectiveness. If we have to stop a treatment, because we know in oncology it's important to give our treatment dose on time, and if we can't deliver this in by complications like an extravasation, it can compromise overall survival for our patient of disease-free survival for our patient. But also like fear for further cyclists. The patients are feared to get a new cyclist, but also like if you look at the team, not confident anymore to give this treatment, or for the individual nurse, how will I cannulate it? Is it something related to me? So we need that confidence in our health, key, health team. And people feel this as nurses are confident to treat. But also like for the organization, Mostly it has financial complications because you have to like the insurance company, uh, but also the reputation. People talk about this easily, and it's not about that things can happen, but it's very important how we manage it, that people feel safe if something has happened. And we as nurses are forefront healthcare providers, we can help to prevent this. So what is prevention in extravasation? So, Considerations before start administration. Who are we giving it to our product? Who is this patient? Uh, what are we going to give? Think about the severity, think about the, the, the products we're gonna give. Are they like blistering? Are they irritating products? So it's important to know. How are we gonna go it to administering? And I'm talking then about vascular access is also very important to think about. Um, how are we gonna like, yeah, making the risk less as possible? And how closely we can monitor. It's very important that we know that monitoring is very important. So if you're working as a nurse only for 20 patients, you know the monitoring will be less than if you have like 10 patients or five patients. So that's also very important to consider at that moment. So the patients, has the patient previous experiences with this? Is the patient experienced with getting cannulated and getting infusion? What is his medical, uh, medical history? Does he already have cardiovascular disorders? And then we can think about it. What is going to be the vascular access we're going to use for this patient? What is the best vascular access? But is our patient's ability to communicate? For example, in Belgium, where I work, we have like, people with different languages. So it's very important that people can talk to us and let us know what are the symptoms and what they feel. And very easily, what you can do with a different language is to make a little chart with some symptoms on it, with icons, so that people can just tell you what they're feeling. And we as nurses know what's happening with our patients. But also empower patients to talk. Inform them about the symptoms and the things they feel so they know when they have to talk to the nurse and when to have to like, yeah, calling for it and say, this I'm, I'm feeling and I think there is something wrong with my infusion. So awareness of the risk is also very important. In our patients, they are well educated about this can happen and what they can do. So we can reduce anxiety and we can make that actions happen really quickly and yeah, prevent that extravasation as happening. So what we can do for the staff, I've talked a lot about it already, like standard procedure are very important that we know how we do act at that moment, but also the level of education and I think exervisation, it's like something that's also very old already, but it's still maintained very important in administrating therapy. So education is key on this. But also like vein puncture techniques, uh, and especially if it's difficult, don't be embarrassed to ask your colleague to do. If you know you have a colleague and he's well experienced to do this and you have a difficult patient, take the right staff with the right patient to make a good cannulation or a good vascular access. Talk about your doctor if you're not confident that the cannulation is the, the best thing to do at that moment. Discuss it with the doctor. Are there any options, other options with this patient to administer safe therapy? 
low patient education, so as nurses as forefront uh, healthcare providers, together with the, medi med the medicals, we can educate our patient on a good level, so they know about this. Insufficient monitoring, so doing more monitoring, write some key elements to observe as a nurse, what we have to observe, it's very important to know, and time process is also very important. We need to get in action if something is happening. We can't wait at that moment. So divide task and know what's happening if it's something happened. For example, what we in our uh, ward have in our day clinic, it's like if something like this happened, we have like a sort of code that everybody is knowing this is happening with the patient, so other colleagues can take over other patients so you can be busy with this extravasation or complication. So that's also very important, not only for the safety of the current patient, but for the safety for other patients also. The substance, we see on yeah, the pH value, osmolarity, mechanism of action, they are responsible of the severity of the injury. If you saw the picture, this was rituximab, and nobody know at that moment was aware about how it could bring this extravasation, and it was like, oh, rituximab, it's not so bad, but see what happens with your patient. So, and also like volume concentration, if you have a high volume and a high dose, a high concentration, it's more risk to have an extravasation, and it's more risk if you have a difficult product to have a higher severity of the extravasation outcome. So, based on the ability of damage of tissue, uh, they have divided in three categories. We have the non vesicants, irritants, and vesicants, and they are like lists around surrounding. And that's good to know that this is on the ward if something happens. We can't think about it and keeping all this data in our head at that moment if we're working, but it's good to have this on the ward. If something you happen that you know already from, oh, this is this product, we keep aware of this. And what we do in our charts, nursing charts, is write it down before we start with our patients. Think about the prevention, the things we have to think about it. What is the product we're going to deliver? So it's, we are aware that this product could be like an irritant. So we are aware of what product we give at that moment. So also very important to discuss is the route, is it pre-treatment, assessing the patient's veins, um, and in such essentially is taking the correct device. Whatever it is cannulation, central venous infusion, is it a pore catheter? You have to choose on basis of what your patient, who is your patient, and what treatment we're gonna give him, how long we're gonna give the treatment, how many punctures we need to give the treatment. So that's important to discuss this with your medical, but also to discuss this with the patient. Because choosing the direct device is, yeah, we have to think about, as already told, duration of therapy, frequency of infusion, the drug classification, very important. Uh, if we have a really high irritant or a vasculant, it's very important to choose a good administration route so we can limit its extravasation risks. Uh, but also think about the patient's choice. What desire the patient? Mostly we can talk about poor catheters or central lines, but if the patient is not in favor or is refusing, we still have to think about a good way to administrate our drugs. And we have also to think about the costs. Um, costs and benefits. Uh, in some countries that's less an issue, like in Belgium it's reimbursed, fully reimbursed, so it's mostly not as things we have to think about it, but I could imagine when it's not reimbursed and it's on the cost of the patient or on the society, this could be an issue to choose a vascular access device. So I think you all know this uh, because you are top nurses. Um, I think with cannulation we have to think about several actions we keep in mind, um, like we use mostly the forearm, we don't use inner hands uh, to give uh, the therapy, um, and also lymphedema, we don't get this way to uh, cannulation at that time. So after cannulation, what is very important to do for nurses, and that's depending on every device, is check if there is blood flow. Are we in the right position before we start with our therapy? Uh, we could flush 10 milliliters normal saline to check uh, if there are any signs. Uh, is there blood coming back? A flashback should always be obtained before drugs. And what's important, what I 
they ask me like, you do it before start therapy, but always when you change therapy, it's also important to also do this, to check again if the infusion is still right at that moment. So a solution between uh, different drugs infusion is recommended. So our observation for our patient, what we can do is monitor our patient, that's obvious I think. But ask patients to report any changes in, in, sensitivity, in sensations, that's also very important. Empower patients to tell what happens. Learn him that a delay can cause something. Delays are like waste of time. We need to act immediately. Never ignore signs if patients tell you something. You better check it than resolve it. So that's very important. And keep observing the flow and resistance. Uh, in our hospital, we have to like administering every anti-cancer drugs with a pump, with infusion pumps. Uh, we can't also we can't do it. So we need an infusion pump to give our drugs. So what we can do at that moment as nurses is stopping the infusion without removing the needle. That's very important. We aspirate the extravasated volume without pressure, I told, not massaging this product in uh, the surroundings. Um, we can elevate it, the position, the limp, if necessary. Uh, we could do cold or warm compresses depending on the product. This is described in literature. Uh, and we can, even it's available, administrating antidotes. Uh, be aware, like antidotes can be very high priced, uh, and then you have, have an agreement with pharmacy, I think, that's available on the ward. I don't know, I have an additional question. On your ward, when you have uh, chemotherapy, are there any extravasation kits available? If something happened, do you have like a box where every material is in it you can use? No. So in our hospital, on every ward, there is like an extravasation kit available. And all the products that need it are inside this. And these products are always, always checked by pharmacy every month. They are available, not over time. So if something happens, we can act immediately together with the physician on the ward. So that's important. Sorry, Irina Valerina, who manages this situation? In our center, the kit, we don't have the kits for extravasation. To, not to prevent, but to manage extravasation. Could you uh, give the mic to the colleague? The colleague would like to comment. Please speak into the mic. I understand, understood that you have private patients who pray for uh, the treatment and you have patients on the insurance where the cost of treatment is reimbursed. If extravasation happened, if it's a patient on a uh, reimbursement policy, does an insurance company cover the treatment of uh, extravasation, or the patient is to pay on his own? That's a good question. The thing is like, if extravasation is happening, you have to have make an evaluation, a registration, that is really, you have to do it for the insurance company. After that, there will be a discussion who is responsible for this. So it's very important that you can say like an insurance company, you have standards of care and you have prevent every, you did everything to prevent this extravasation. Elsewise, and that's what I say in the outcome for the management and the clinic, it could be like a financial consequence for the clinic to have to pay for the care for the patient at that moment. So it's depending. So it's very important that you prevent, try to prevent this and you can even talk about the actions you, you did to manage this well with the patients. But mostly the insurance company, we are insured as a hospital for these uh, things that can happen. Getting back to the previous discussion as to the kits for extravasation, in our oncological hospitals, we have only two types of kits. Uh, the anti-aphylactic anti shock, 
uh, prevention of para parenteral infections and uh, uh, the kit for prevention uh, anaphylactic reactions or immediate allergic reactions. It's a very relevant topic for us, and I think we will pull efforts and we will work with doctors on this in this respect. I'd like to comment. The comment is very important. The prevention of the anaphylactic shock, uh, it, it's a different story. Well, we don't talk about extravasation in our hospitals. I have one more question. Now in Russia, uh, our alcohol is not used in uh, the hospitals. How do you do compresses? Maybe it's a... Uh, Холодные и теплые компрессы, они используются, это имеется доказательная база для этого. Очень важно прописать это в стандартах исследований. Care is available, so you know directly what to happen and make the decision together with your physician. Коллеги, я понимаю, очень активная дискуссия по поводу спирта. Understood that very active discussion is going on as to the use of alcohol. It's a very acute topic for discussion. Could you briefly say uh, what uh, what's uh, the content? of these kits, emergency kits for extravasation. What kind of medication and devices? The medication is depending on which, uh, the product you're using, uh, if there is a, any antidote available, uh, but also the like, like a normal saline solution in this kit, also products to dilute the, the content or the extravasating area, uh, also like a standard of care, the protocol uh, is included. And also, like the material you use, you have to need you need at that moment. But the thing is, like I want to say, it doesn't have to be on every ward in your hospital. Maybe you could you could make a central place in your hospital where an extravasation kit is available, because the best thing is that it's never happening. Eh? So, but the important is if this is happening, you get directly like your products. And it's a little bit like the anaphylactic kit. It's about like the, the time you have to take the materials to get and get in action as a nurse. So that's very important. But it could be like in the closet on the, co but it's very important that everybody knows on the ward where the kit is. Because if you don't know where the kit is, you can't use it. So. About registration. Um, it's very important that we register if this happens, uh, I told before. And it's very good to document this in, a, in your electronic documents or in your flow charts, with, in the charts of the, the patient file, uh, and you measure it. And you make, even you can make a photograph of it, or more easily, you can take like a pen and draw a circle around it so that everybody knows what's happening with what, the extravasation. Because if we do a handover to our colleague in the ne next shift, he wants to know what's changed about this extravasation. He wants to want to observe this. So if we don't document it, he can't observe it, what's happening. Is it getting worse? Is it getting better? We need to assess regulatory, so it's keep on going, and depending on the standard of care you want to create. Uh, I told already, outline the area, because this is important for observation, uh, and report all these changes. This is very important data, also for the physician, but also maybe for the plastic surgeon that's come across later in a later stage. So it's also very important we follow up our patient uh, because they have lasting injuries, scarring and pain. Uh, in case of this lady, she was like had flaps in surgery for her whole arm. She couldn't move it anymore. The muscles were also like uh, had an impact. So afterwards, they have like, OK, they need extra care. But could you imagine the psychological injury for this patient, an infusion-related reaction, and then an extravasation? At that age, she was alone at home. How is she going to manage this? The fear she gets if she gets further therapy, what's she going to do? Who's she going to talk about it? 
remember the negative experience. And the negative experience is not only for the patient, it's also for the healthcare team. So it's very important you can talk about this, what happens on the ward, and you can talk and discuss it with the whole healthcare team. And this is also something you can take in like a multidisciplinary discussion. If something like this happens on your ward, you have to discuss this and ask yourself how we can prevent this more together with the whole healthcare team. Where can we can implement actions to improve our outcomes with patients? So the need for additional care for our patient is also like protect from sun, custom clothing, and that's something we can teach our patients to help our patients to get better quality of life even after a complication like exervization. So quickly, because my time is coming to an end, uh, I want to some, give some information about nausea and vomiting. It's also infusion related. Um, it's mostly a gastrointestinal complication, uh, but we see it's like the top five, the greatest fear of patients if they get chemotherapy, being like nausea and vomiting, they are really terrified about it. Because this is something if patients, mostly the first questions they ask, do I gonna lose my hair? And do I gonna be sick about this therapy? These are common questions for our patients. So what can it be? It could be also like nausea and vomiting, could also be the result of the disease itself, but also from the anti-cancer therapy that we give to the patient. It could be like precipitate to a life-threatening complication, dehydration, cachexia with our patients. They could be life-threatening at one moment. And they have a high impact on the quality of life of our patients and the caregivers and the family for our patient, the whole context. So nausea and vomiting, it's also very important to know it's not one symptom. Nausea is a symptom and vomiting is a symptom. Because mostly we see if people talking about it, it's like they talk about nausea and vomiting, but they're two different things. So, and if you talk about chemo-induced nausea and vomiting, we talk about CN and NVV. So what could it treat it? Like treatment-inducted metabolic causes, gastrointestinal causes, neurological disorder, other causes. You see, it's complex to understand. So I think it's very important that we assess our patient at front. What is an, we have also a classification to think about. Is it an acute vomiting? Do we have delayed vomiting with our patients? Uh, that's after 24 hours of the chemotherapy. Is it a reaction to something? Is it occurring despite the good medication we give? Or is it refractory? Everything we do, it couldn't help the patient. He's still vomiting. So these are the risk factors if you go to the literature. A lot of risk factors, and that's easy to assess with our patients. That's easy to go over and think about it. Is this patient at risk for this nausea and vomiting? More at risk as nausea and vomiting. So we see there are lists available. What is high, low, moderated? But it's not just, just a product on itself, because most chemotherapy schemes are like combinations of drugs and doses. They also think about the doses we administer to the patients. If you see this, this is like MASC, ESMO, ASCO, uh, all together, the guidelines. Uh, and I see at that moment, the MASC is the multi-association of, of a supportive cancer uh, therapy. They are at this moment have their Congress in the USA. Um, and they are talking about these symptoms also to improve this. Uh, but nursing actions to improve this, we can do be aware and anticipate the care needs of the patients, because sometimes something is triggering this, so it's important to know this at front. So an improve, yeah, go preventing is key word again. Prevent this with our patients. These, these have a major impact on the quality of life. And do um, yeah, assessments, pre-treatment assessment with our patients, uh, ask about the risk factors, and use tools to occurrence and constancy with our patients. So be knowledgeable about the evidence that's available. Uh, I saw it last day also, it was included in the chemotherapy schemes already to, to use medication to prevent it. Uh, appropriate family and patient education again. It's very important to educate our patients again about this situation and develop again standards, protocols, standards of care for our patients. I go a little bit faster about this because uh, so patient education, before we start with our patient, provide information about what we're gonna do, provide uh, information about the medication we give, uh, 
and give a written medication to uh, written plans to uh, to our patient. Let him participate in the management of his disease and management of treatment. Got a little bit faster. Uh, so be aware of the financial toxicity also. Uh, and the most important thing that I think in, we see in our practice, as we don't deliver on demand, we go around the clock with our uh, medication for the patient, we as prevention, uh, because we see if patient has to take the medication at the moment, they have like vomiting or uh, nausea, it doesn't work as quickly or as good as we do it at front. So I'll skip this question maybe for later. This is mask. They have a nice tool. And the good thing is it's translated in Russian. So you can use it. It's available free on the website to use. Um, and that's what I thought. This is a very important that these evidence-based tools are great to use. And it's good they are translated in different languages. So this is like the uh, mask and ESMO guidelines. I think they use it in the hospital. Uh, it's a good overview on acute nausea and vomiting. These are the late nausea and vomiting uh, guidelines. I don't go in depth of it. Um, but nursing management on anticipatory chemotherapy. Oh. Yeah. Um, it's got most effective strategies to prevention through the use of optimal uh, antiemetic agents. Behavior techniques can be useful, uh, but also, like sometimes, it's useful to send the patient to the psychologist. This could be helpful for patients because something can trigger this, and that's not medication based. It's stuck, I think. Sorry. Yeah, break to nausea, uh, consider around the clock instead on demand doses, and patient is promoting parenteral or rectal administration could be useful if it's possible at that time. Because like rectal administration at the hematology ward at our department, we are not in favor of it to <coughs> induce infections, for example. So I think the take home message are be aware of your patient risk factors, use validated assessment tools, start on the right foot, education and shared decision making as key, uh, remind patients about the possibility, the possible signs and the symptoms and side effects that they know about it. And observation, that's key what we're doing. Observation and clinical thinking at that moment, something is happening, that's a real key thing. And we as, health, as nurses can do this very well. Engage a multidisciplinary team like the physician, psychologist uh, maybe, and stay in touch with your patient and give him a good follow-up so we can improve quality of life at the end. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Dear colleagues, we have very, very little time for discussion. Do you have any questions? Because it's a very actual topic. As for this kit, to prevent and treat extravasation, Yehon, could you please what you have in your kits and in detail what is the code you use when you identify these or that complications. In uh, the kit, I can, I'm happy to send you over what we use in our hospital and you can use it. It's free to use. It's evidence-based so everybody can use it. I think it's very important. Uh, the other thing in the code is like, if something like this happens, it's not only extravasation, but you can have a reanimation, for example. You can have another reaction, an anaphylactic reaction. It's like we are throwing, and that's very easy to do, we're throwing the pillow of the patient out of the door, and it's in the hallway. So people know that something in that room is happening like an emergency. And that's very important. And that's easy. You don't need anything. You don't any any fancy lighting or something. You're just throwing the pillow out of in the hallway. Yeah, and that's like a occurrence. That is an emergency at that time. Спасибо. Thank you. It's very interesting, and the pillow thing. Well, we've got fancy lights actually. Thank you. Nurses have to be creative, and we are creative. So. Go ahead.